Hey everyone, thank you for joining. It is actually week 12 for me. Um, so this is three full months of doing the Integrative Wellness Collective and I'm super excited because I feel like every week I have on really unique, amazing women that um, I wanna share this platform with so that they could really shine their light and be wellness um, uh, influencers out there and help you get healthy and well and feel good about yourselves. So um, tonight we're gonna be talking to my friend Doro. Um, she has a really interesting backstory and I think so many of us that find ourselves in the wellness industry and in the wellness community, we all have some sort of wellness story that brought us to where we are today. And um, if you can hear Dora's accent, she's from Germany. And so she was born and raised in Europe. Um, and I just have just such a, a fondness of Europe since I spent four years in the Netherlands. And uh, I, you know, as a young adult and I experienced what it was like to be connected to n nature, uh, especially seeing farms and, you know, running through farms and cycling through farms. It was kind of like a way of life for, for Europeans, especially in that area. Um, so, for, for everyone that wants to know about uh, Doro's backstory, as from what I understand from you, that you grew up a, in a family of seven, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a yes. lot of kids, it's a lot of mouths to feed, it's a lot of food to be put on the table. Um, luckily, you were in a country that, you know, um, has a lot of farms around. Um, and really, you had your own health journey. So your son was born with a birth defect. Correct. You, you wound up having mycotoxicity. So for those of you that don't know, it's mold toxicity. And then on top of that, it was Lyme, correct? Yeah. Or was that the other way around? Okay. And then you wound up kind of going on this journey of finding and using food as medicine. Exactly. So I, my first question to you then is, what happened to you, um, obviously, around the time when your son was born? And how did you wind up correlating some of this eating and healthy lifestyle of eating with pregnancy and giving birth and raising a healthy child and then moving on through your history? Well, what happened when my son was born, I was 28. I had no clue what's going on. So he was born with quite a birth defect, which required for his time now. He's, tw he's going to be 24 this year. Oh, my God. So anyway, he had like um, 12 surgeries through his lifetime. You know, there was a lot of in and out. It really affects his digestive system. He's doing remarkable well for what he has, you know, and he's navigating his life by himself now. He just moved out. Yay, so, mom. <laughs> you did a good job. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm remarkable. You know, he. I'm so proud of him. Sure. He's a remarkable human. And during that time when he first was born, I just really was surviving. You know, I wasn't really thinking that much about food except the way I was growing up. You know, I mean, I grew up with organic food around me. Um, you know, my father was very health conscious. My mother died uh, when I was young, when I was five years old. So I'm not sure, you know, how he, she would have influenced my way of being. But, um, you know, we ate organic foods. It was grain based. My father was vegetarian, you know, so I didn't grow up with typical German food per se. Mm. And, um, you know, I make a joke, you know, that he had a grain for every day of the week. So um, we ate a lot of grains. Yet, you know, and, you know, during that time, I didn't pay that much attention. You know, there was no sugar in our house and certain things like that. So it was just like, that's just what it was. You know, I didn't question it much. And then when I really started breaking down with was when my son was older and actually, you know, really when the surgeries had subsided and um, I just realized, you know, and I had a second child, so I, had, I have two sons, <clears throat> that you know as a mother what we do we nourish everybody but we don't nourish ourselves and it's just how it is it's not you know some of us are better at it because they're being you know taught it but for me i was just in such a surviving mode of you know taking care of those kids figuring this whole um, medical system out and how to navigate the best way through it that at a certain point when i was 38 you know i really got sick and at first, I didn't know what it was. Both of my parents died of cancer. So I figured, you know, maybe there's something genetic there. You know, I had a thyroid underfunction, but I was incredibly fatigued. So 
we had a beach house at that point and um in hindsight i know there was mold you know and i saw mold but i never thought about it you know i didn't put one and one together but you know i just had this fatigue you know i couldn't get out of you know and then i started questioning myself is it my mind you know am i depressed and i said yeah life is hard but it's not that bad you know you know all of those excuses we all do and then um i went to the doctor he diagnosed low thyroid function and then i went you know to multiple doctors found a functional medicine doctor and she actually um diagnosed me with mold toxicity and that i had um that i had exposure and it looked like on my blood work it was like an old exposure but it explained a lot and through that through that journey and just having to rely on doctors and not getting answers and not wanting to go on um antidepressants i just started researching and the research out there back then it's different now because the search engines have changed a little bit was when i was looking at thyroid function there was a really good um um good articles out there chris cressa was really one of the biggest influences on me back then where i just found out so if your thyroid is not functioning it's the symptoms usually of something else and then i found you know that was 12 years ago i just found out about paleo a little bit and people had such good results and i figured you know i have nothing to lose I was very happy to not have to give up meat because I actually do enjoy meat a lot and my body does well with it. So I went on a paleo diet and the interesting thing was that I had gained weight, you know, which I couldn't really explain. And then when I went on the paleo diet what happened is that my body really shifted within 4 weeks. You know, it slimmed down and I ate more than i've ever ate before it's right. just like i and it usually happens yeah i ate so much food but it was yeah. all food you know and all the time too you know i didn't deprive myself at all i just kept eating and then through that i realized man there's some really some real power with nourishing yourself you know and eating well for yourself and that's how i then enrolled into um the nutrition certification with the nutritional therapy association mm -hmm. and through that journey i just learned so much more about health and well-being that um then i eventually found out with a chiropractor who did muscle testing that i had um lime mm. and because even though i was eating well i did all the self care you know and i was pretty strict about how i ate um i just couldn't get my energy back up and then when i found out about that you know i was a little shocked and i, I thought to myself okay it's still better than cancer you know yeah, for especially in your lineage yes and um and then i just started self experimentation of going down the herbal route and treating myself because i only had three bands showing i didn't have the typical five bands for cdc right. Right. So I wasn't sure, you know, how much support I will get from doctors, especially if I didn't want to go completely outside of the system. Mm. And I just realized that nutrition was really for me the basis of shifting everything around. It just gave me a framework where I could navigate without crashing too much. Mm -hmm. and then i really wanted to learn about it and once i learned and went through the program of the nta i just really got such a profound knowledge where i was able to support my family and as well my son who was older at that point of going like gee you know there's so much you can do for yourself and for your healing mm -hmm. and then through that you know i came slowly to where i'm at now that i'm I wouldn't say I'm completely healed. I'm not sure if there's such a thing like that, you know. It's always a quest. We're always Exactly. Ex yeah. Exactly. It's such a journey. Yeah. But at this point in my life, I feel so well. My energy is pretty good. Um am I yeah. Actually, yeah, if you don't mind me asking how old you are, you don't have to tell me if you don't want to. No, no. I no no. I love okay. I love getting older. It beats your alternative. It yeah. I'm, I'm 51. I'm amazing. 51 get amazing. going on 52, yeah. Great. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. I mean, I'm 48 and it's you know, I 
I find that e each time in my life, as I really look at my wellness and self care, it is just getting better because I'm learning new things and I'm learning new ways to just take care of and nourish myself. And I, I, it's really beautiful. And, and in the profession that we're both in, you know, we get to see people that we can allow this kind of almost like lotus blossom, right, to bloom. And we can watch people heal themselves and, and have them become somewhat ageless in a way because really age is just a number. It has really has to do with how you feel. Nydia is giving us, you know, the, yes, Nydia. She's another gorgeous <laughs> lady we know. Yes. Um, but it's so interesting, you know, I have a patient of mine who suffers, who has been suffering from mycotoxicity and she was, um, she was a teacher for many years and she was kind of stuck in a basement teaching for 30 years and uh, wound up with, you know, pulmonary issues. She looks like she has uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Uh, she sometimes needs oxygen and she's in her very early 50s and she feels like she's 90. Right. And it's really sad because there's such there's not many doctors that will um, look at this in, uh, as its efficacy, right? I mean, and, and not many doctors really want to go down the road, road or route of um, diagnosing mycotoxicities, but it could be really a problem. Not to mention, you know, the foods that we eat really are covered with so many um, fun fungi and that could actually even spark some of these fungal irritations that we have in our system. So it's really quite interesting. Um, and then the Lyme component, right? I mean, the Lyme on top of it. So I don't know about you and your practice, but for me, I see that people that have this kind of low grade chronic inflammatory process of whatever, the food they're eating, the stress that they're under, um, the amount of cortisol that's running through their system, it feeds on each other. It's like the rat in a wheel. So it's like, when can they actually get healthy and well is the when they can kind of put a cog in the wheel and stop it from spinning so that they could really kind of dive in deep and say what is this actual problem instead of taking more you know things over the counter or prescribed yes and it would be so helpful for for doctors to just acknowledge that there's such a thing in mycotoxins you know and that mold exposure is actually a problem for a group of people. And it's the interesting thing too, you know, because it's not a huge percentage of the population, yet those are the people who suffer the most, you know. And then if you cannot acknowledge it, you really think it's in your head and you're nuts. That's right. And you know, yeah, I, I closed my practice in New York City, obviously with COVID and I was there for many years and I was on the top floor and um, every time it rained, I would have, there would be like ring on the ceiling so it was coming through the roof and um around two years ago i started to experience dermatitis that looked like eczema and whenever i left my new york city practice my skin would clear up and then when i would go back my, i would get eczema again and it was so fascinating because i have not had any form of any dermatological irritation since i left my practice in new york city a year ago Wow. And I know for sure. And when I'm around mold, I will have a little bit of a dermatological flare up. So there is some sort of, you know, inflammatory process that's going on due to experiencing the, you know, toxicity of the fungus, the mold. Yeah. And how brilliant is it that you were able to put one and one together too? Because right. that, that's, the, that's the part as well of the self-awareness and all of that, you know. We're going through these healing journeys because, as well, because there's a certain disconnect happening for whatever reason. You know, it's a natural way of just being. And, you know, sometimes we just have to go do, right? So, and when we do that, we often disconnect and we don't have time to actually look what's, what's happening. And then once you're able to put one and one together, that's though the point in your life where you can make an adjustment and then shift your way of how you're going to live your life and then therefore the healing process can get started yeah and i think so many of us i think society as a whole especially here in this country you know we're we're bombarded so much with um these ideas or deprivation or let's go on these certain diets or you know what's the new fad or all these packaged goods or all these creams and things and injectables and all this stuff, that what it does is it disconnects us once again from what feels right 
because we can all calibrate to what feels right and what's homeostasis, our own ability to balance ourselves. But we're brainwashed almost into believing that everything else around us knows better for us than we do. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and that's just mind blowing, you know, and, and, you know, it takes me to this question for you as somebody that teaches people how to really self nourish and nourishment. I have plenty of patients that say like, I don't like cooking. I don't cook. I don't like it. And it's like, wow, you know, how do you, I grew up in a family of loving to cook. So for me, cooking means every time I put my stuff together, it means that my body has this imprint of self-love. So I have reconnected my experience of, of, of food with, hey, my body's so worth this. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's like I'm depositing into the bank a whole bunch of gold. And, you know, how do you get, how do you, how do you inspire your clients really to, to not go down that slippery slope of let me grab a bar or let me grab a package good, or let me join, this is the newest one, a new pyramid MLM, you know, <laughs> that somebody else at the top could make money while I'm sitting here starving myself with 600, you know, calories a day. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you inspire people? Well, it's always the question for me when I'm talking to my clients and I'm, when I'm working with people, what is really your goal, right? What's your goal for yourself? And then there is the requirement of a certain amount of commitment. But what I found, what I found for myself is, you know, when my kids were little, you know, cooking became a little bit my safe space. And it was a, a space where I could create because I didn't really learn to cook from growing up. My father wasn't a foodie, even though my whole family is a foodie. And I have to do a shout out because my sister from Germany is on. I want to say hello. And I saw that one of my boys jumped on too. Thanks. So um, it is really the thing of realizing what are you worth. And I think what I've learned with cooking really is Initially, we think cooking is we're cooking for others. It's again, you know, we're again going outside. But then eventually we are, and since it's usually us women, you know, that's why it's so gender specific that when a man is in the kitchen, how fucking sexy is that? Super sexy. Right? You know, we can be freaking naked in the kitchen. We can be three star chefs, whatever it is. But everybody says, oh, yeah, she's a great cook, but that's it. A dude right. goes in the kitchen and just prepares one meal really well. And you're right. like, oh my God. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's not fair. Um, Guys in the kitchen are sexy for sure. They are. They are. <laughs> so what, what I found for myself eventually, and it, it's this whole quest of self-care anyway, right? I mean, how amazing is it when you're being cooked for? Right? It's, you feel it's, loved. You feel loved. It's sure. such a, such a gift. Yeah. Yet if in your structure, when you're there, you don't have that, that someone cooks for you, right. you really got to give it to yourself. So yeah. there is many ways of going about it. You know, you, especially where we live. I mean, we live in a freaking food abundance. Yeah. We have so many resources that cooking can be super easy. I mean, you can have pre-cut vegetables, yeah. you can have frozen vegetables, yeah. make it simple. Blast some music. If yeah. you drink alcohol, have a glass of glass wine, of wine. It, right? Light dance. Hand, light have a dance hand. party in the kitchen. Exactly. <laughs> if the kids are annoying, just turn the music up more. <laughs> and they might want to switch, you know, their music on then too, right. which you can do. You can okay. integrate them. But it's, it's really, how do you really want to create a space for yourself that you go like, Wow. You know, and then there's these moments for myself. I don't love cooking every night. I, I don't, you know, I'm honest, you know. Yeah. Yet, if I don't lay my week out and think about what am I going to have and I don't have the stuff ready, I will have ice cream for dinner. That's right. Or take out. Yep. Yeah. You know, yep. and it's eh. But then you have these evenings and that's where you really get your nourishment from where you cook something and you're like, fuck, I'm good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're like, yeah, exactly. Right. You know, all I need is me, you know, right <laughs> now. But, but,
but yeah. it won't happen every day. Yeah. It's just how it is. Yet we can really, by creating simple um, shortcuts for ourselves, we can create super easy meals within 20 minutes. Yeah, it's true. I, I think people just have this idea that like cooking for themselves is very daunting. Um, you know, it wasn't really until I started, you know, I had wanted to lose a little bit of weight and I really did, and this is about maybe six years ago. And I really, you know, I'm Italian. I grew up in an Italian family. Like food was always a big thing. We always ate. I cannot give up eating. And I thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because the minute I hear the word diet, I equate it with deprivation. And when you're deprived of something, you want it more. It's just a psychological task, right? It, it yeah. makes you more hungry and hangry. And so I actually fell into the uh, flexible dieting plan, which is paleo based. And it got me very in touch with understanding the pro my proper macro ratios. So really understanding my protein, carbs, and fats. And what seemed to be first very daunting in that I, if I was going to do some self-love, I said, okay, you can commit to one month. If you can love up on everyone else, one month you give yourself. You can give yourself 31 days. And I bought my little food scale and I sat in the kitchen and I said, you need to understand what six ounces of a protein actually looks like. What is, you know a hundred grams of broccoli look like what do these things look like because my tendency is to be qual quantity and just coming from this big italian family you know everything is you know just eat and eat and eat but that's not going to get you to be be you know thinner or slimmer or you know less fat so i wound up starting to weigh my foods and um it was pretty shocking when i actually saw what certain things weighed and i really you know had this very healthy decline of calories until i reached my goal weight and that's when i started racing and now anytime i'm kind of moving into a racing season i go back to that idea of this very healthy macro balanced type of diet which allows me to have the glass of wine and the piece of chocolate and you know the the purple Japanese potato and the sushi and all the things. Because the minute you say to me, I can't have something, I'm now obsessing about not having it and wanting it more. Yeah. And, and, and that's what these dietary trends, I think in America, you know, you've got the keto, the intermittent fasting, the vegetarianism, the veganism. You know, when I went to acupuncture school, we had an entire class on Chinese dietary theory and it was just so fascinating because it's based on the five tastes. You know, it's based on how the liver and sour and pungent and sweet and all the organ systems and the, the disconnect between when you have cravings and what organ systems are actually not in balance. And I'm sure you find this too, when somebody has a sugar craving, um, you know, what do you do in that case? Like, what would you tell a client if they had a sugar craving? How would you offset that? You know, when someone has a sugar craving and they're really dealing with that, you know, I um, first of really have them sit down and write down what's going on. Because cravings come from various um, uh, ways of being. One way is, I think, as a tendency, most people actually undereat. Yes, I think most people don't realize that. Yeah. They're starting. And, yeah, and then the, the a really big big issue I see with some of my clients is that you wake up, we're not hungry because most of us are slow, slow, have a slow metabolism, right? Yet you have coffee first thing in the morning. So you're, you're just really adding fuel to your fire of stress. So you're sort of stressed out, you know, you might start going into menopause, you know, you're dealing with this, you have little kids. So there's already a stress level we all deal with. And it's just natural. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's just how it is. And then the very first thing we do, all of us, is really we're drinking, um, um, we're drinking coffee. And then usually this satiates us for a while, but then all of a sudden we get hungry. Rather than giving ourselves maybe just an herbal tea in the morning, waiting half an hour and eating some, something small. So... I'm, I'm more savory in the morning, definitely. I'm more the ice cream person at night. 
<laughs> so um, savory in the morning, have a couple of um, eggs in the morning, you know, and maybe I have some vegetables with it, maybe not, but that usually carries me to a certain point. And then I can have my coffee because I don't want to stress my adrenals out and my cortisol and spike myself up in such a way that by all of a sudden lunchtime, I'm crashing. And since I myself have a little bit of a blood sugar dysfunction, you know, I need to be even keeled anyway. So I really try to support my system. So if you're coming out of a natural fast, which sleeping is. You Hence know, the word break fast. Exactly. <laughs> People forget that, right? You're breaking okay. the fast in the morning. Mm -hmm. So then have a little bit, have something small. If you do dairy and fruit and if you do well with it, Right. You know, great. You know, I, I don't, you know, I need, I need protein. I need something savory. I can have sweeter stuff usually later in the day and then I'm okay. But if I do it first thing in the morning, I just going to burn out by 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. So I have a couple of eggs, probably some vegetables. If I do my gluten-free toast, I do that sometimes. And then I have my coffee. And that really supports me then into really having that energy the coffee will push you into because I have fuel in my system. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because if you're running on empty, you're running on empty, where are you gonna take it from? You know, think of it as a car, you know, that's what I use as an analogy for um, my clients is like, all right, when you're going on empty in a car, you go to the gas station. So we're waking up in the morning empty, mm -hmm. you know? Yes, and that's why we're groggy and whatnot. And some of us wake up really quick, you know, good for them, not me, take me a moment. But um, support yourself. And what does that actually mean, supporting yourself? As well in your ways of choosing what you're eating. So what I do with most of my clients, I put them on an um, elimination diet. You know, it's just like, let's leave the main offenders for everybody out because everybody else is so individual too. So not one size fits all. Right. But if you do something like that for three weeks, usually the system starts calming down. Mm -hmm. And then once the system starts calming down, then you can listen. Then yeah. you go like, oh, this works. This doesn't work so good. Oh, I had this for breakfast. Now I'm crashing. Oh much sugar for my system oh maybe i'm going to be protein heavier in the morning mm -hmm. and then go into carbohydrates and more sweeter stuff later on as a little pick me up but by that i'm just guiding them into actually understanding what their body needs and um, um, really uses throughout the day rather than me telling them everything what to do. And then when we're done with, they don't know what to do. And then all of a sudden on their own, it is about educate, ed educating what does this amazing system we live in, this body actually do? What is its functionality? Once you understand it, then you know how to work it. It's like driving a car, right? If we would be sitting in the car and just um, hitting the gas pedal, but not using the gears, we're not going anywhere. Right. The same thing is if we don't understand what digestion is as a functionality, then you don't know how to adjust to it when you actually need to. Mm -hmm. 100%. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned gluten and um, this is a hot one. It's a hot topic. I put a, a poll out on Instagram stories and um, I, I got 50 responses, which I was like, wow. Um, and every single one of them, the question was um, something of the effect, if you were to like follow a specific type of diet. And I gave the four choices, uh, keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarianism, gluten-free. And 50 or 60% of them all said gluten-free. Mm -hmm. And um, one said gluten-free because of menopause. Another said they're gluten intolerant. Another said gluten gives you gives her sores in her mouth. Um, another one, restless leg, joint pain. I mean, it's just tremendous. And you know, I wanted to talk to you and kind of get, have you give everyone out here some idea between this this concept of gluten insensitivity versus celiac, which is a true dis, dis 
eased state, state where you just cannot, you're having a, an inflammatory reaction, you can't digest any sort of wheat and gluten. So talk to us about that. And when you have somebody, because I know you are gluten free as well, correct? Because yes. it did help you. Um, and I also noticed, I, I'm going to go back to my heritage of, of being Italian, you know, we, we live on pasta. In this country, when I eat pasta, I become a congested sinus wreck. When I go to Italy and I eat pasta, I could eat it all day long. Right. Um, and it's really interesting. I wanted to ask you about that experience of, of gluten sensitivity versus celiac, and then talk to us about that if you can. So the re remarkable thing about gluten is that gluten in itself inherently is inflammatory. Yet it was never such an issue because when we used ancient grains and we usually would ferment the grains, you know, in a sourdough or whatnot, we pre-digest the gluten so it's easier um, absorbable by the body. Mm -hmm. So well, what we're doing, because we want to have higher yields in everything we're doing, so we hybridize the grains. So the grains at this point where we're at, especially in the U.S., has... 30% more of gluten content in the grain. So if you eat that three times a day, when you hit 40, particularly as a woman, you're probably getting gluten sensitivity. And um, what gluten does in the intestine as well, we have these um, nice little junctions in the intestine because the intestine is actually remarkable and very flexible because we need to absorb um, nutrients, right? So gluten does release a hormone in our system, which is called zonulin. So what, when that happens, the tight junctions of our intestine open up a little bit and letting more yeah. inflammatory proteins into the system. So when that happens, we have a reaction. And then when we get older and we start going through the changes and whatnot, we're just more sensitive, period. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just something we need to navigate. So the difference between a sensitivity is that you're sensitive to it, but when you're reducing that kind of food, you're usually reducing your inflammation. When you're having a celiac um, disease, you're having an allergy against gluten. And gluten in itself is a really actually very interesting, um, has an interesting protein in it, which is gliadin. And gliadin has a similar structure than the hormone of our thyroid. So that's why so many people who are thyroid underfunctioning or have thyroid issues have actually gluten sensitivity or, and or celiac disease. Mm -hmm. They go hand in hand because the thyroid um, hormone and the gliadin are so similar that when your body gets assaulted with these opening of the tight junctions and you have more gluten and gliadin going in your system, your body eventually will get confused and cannot differentiate between gliadin and the thyroid hormone. And that's when the um, body goes into an overfunction of a mechanism, you know, to defending itself. And that's when it can happen that you end up having your um, thyroid being affected by that and attacked. And that's where you can go into autoimmunity. So what I found for myself and for many of my clients, when you get off gluten, your system just calms down because you have less inflammation. Mm -hmm. So, and the reason is because the much higher content of gluten in grains, period, and then as well of all of the other life stressors we're dealing with nowadays, which are so subtle. You know, it's not like, and that's the interesting thing of where we're living. It's not like we're living in a dangerous world, right? You know, there's no saber tooth tiger chasing us and then we go somewhere and safe and recover. It's these gentle little stressors from Wi-Fi, from driving, from right now the news and what's going on in the world, it affects everybody of us differently. Mm -hmm. So when you're then adding the stress of food and gluten on top of it, it's just putting um, oil on fire. Oil on the fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And inflammation is a beautiful thing because it really helps our body heal. Necessary, sure. Yeah. The problem is when we get stuck in it. That's right.
So by eliminating gluten and being gluten free, we start helping our body to shift out of that stress response. And that's why, do, why so many people do better on a gluten free diet. Hmm. You know, I had read a, a book on thyroid function many years ago through a naturopath, and they talked about three things, uh, chlorine, bromine, and fluorine. And those three things affect thyroid function as well. And what's, what, you know, if you can remember back in, I guess, the 1980s, when you look on the side of a bread container or a bread packaging, it says fortified with bromine. And, and then what's in our water supply? <laughs> fluoride right so but yeah and chlorine and chlorine right what's you know you can sometimes smell it so i actually take a supplement that supports naturally that supports my thyroid uh because i swim as a triathlete i don't have any open water swimming opportunities so right. i take a triiodide um, natural supplement that supports my thyroid so it can combat the stressor of this massive amounts of chlorine that I'm swimming in every, you know, every, twice a week. Right. Um, it's really fascinating. But again, when you learn about it, you can learn how to, how to combat it. Exactly. Um, and you know, what's interesting too, with gluten sensitivity, it's, it's not just a, a digestive issue, but again, you know, you see skin issues and brain fog and, you know, joint pain, numbness. I mean, the lit, if you, even if you just do a quick Google search on, effects of, of gluten sensitivity, you, you'd be shocked at, at, at what you see. So I always say to patients, if you have this kind of chronic inflammatory thing going on, you want to try to just play with how to, how to um, use food, start by eliminating gluten. I have all of my women that I'm treating for um, uh, pregnancy or fertility. I'm like, listen, I won't work with you unless you go off of gluten for at least a month. I mean, let we, I got to get you into a, a, a no, you know, I got to get the inflammation down. So, exactly. you know, when they say, I ask them, what do you eat for breakfast? And they tell me a bagel with cream cheese and all the things. And I'm like, we got gluten and dairy, you know, but like, here we go. Do you know if you're gluten or dairy or, you know, lactose intolerant or it's sensitive, but it's really interesting. So I want to take this next time to talk about ancestry, because I, I think there's a really important piece here. And um, let's, you know, I go back to this idea of, you know, when I was in acupuncture school and we studied with this ancient physician and he wrote a book called Prescriptions Worth a Thousand Gold. And it was all about using food as medicine. And if you look mm -hmm. at some of the, you know, even just some of the things on the shelves now, like um, Shisandra Berry, Right. right. Shisandra berry is a very typical Chinese berry that we use to support chi. Um, and, you know, in Western medicine, we use it to combat adrenal stress or adrenal fatigue. Yeah. So, in, you know, I don't know about you with teas. I happen to love the company Traditional Medicinals. I do, I do love them. Um, you might have other ones. Yogi teas are really good, too. But some of the things that you can find in, you know, your local supermarkets maybe that aren't shop right or you know maybe more whole foods but um they do have some really good ancient um herbal formulas and prescriptions that are based on old formulas so talk to me about this ancestral idea of eating and how that plays into you know 2021 and people's issues around food well, I think one thing we all have to acknowledge and realize is that we're living in a complete food abundance. It's, we're just overwhelmed. And Hence that, our obesity epidemic. Absolutely. And um, living in such abundance, we as a organic being are wired to eat. We're not wired to not eat. So those are the two bases, you know, I'm coming from when I talk with people about that. And then as well, really learning why are we eating? Because if you go into a supermarket, the first time I came to this country and I went with my ex-husband to a supermarket. Like overwhelmed. I was paralyzed. Yeah. That happened to me when I came home from living in Holland. Yeah. I, I had like heart palpitations. It was, yeah. it was so big. It was too much. Yeah. Was it we have one whole aisle and you know the supermarkets in Germany are small in comparison right so we have a 
regular supermarket here, which is like massive. And then um, you have a whole aisle dedicated to cereals alone. Yeah. And so it's, it's not like you have 10 cereals. No, you have 35 or more. And, and, and I go like, I said, you know, you shop. I, I, I'm not, you know, I don't know what to do here. I have no idea. I don't care. I'm just like, wow. And then you read the labels, no fat. And I'm like, okay, this is way too much for me. But coming back to ancestral way of eating. So when we're looking at history and we can go into a paleo style, you know, where they really go into hunter gatherer, which is one field, but I don't personally think we need to go that far back. I mean, we can to understand why this, we are human, you know, we're sapiens, you know, we haven't genetically changed that much. You know, we might be a little softer just because we don't have, you know, to survive the way they needed to. And we definitely don't have to use a lot of energy to get the foods we're now getting because we can walk into a grocery store and get everything. We don't have to hunt anything. But I often well, we sit for nine hours a day in front of a computer. Oh, yeah, which is a lot of fun. Right. Uh, absolutely. And then, which is magical on the other hand, too, because we can have this kind of a connection as well. But the thing is, just go back 100 years. How did our grandparents eat, right? Right. You know, so, yeah, it was more basic. Yes, it was grain-based. You know, there were certain things, especially if you're from European heritage. Yet it was way ba more basic, you know, it was smaller meals. There was no snacking. Mm -hmm. Snacking is a modern phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Eating constantly is a modern phenomenon. Drinking sugary drinks is a modern phenomenon. You know, juices were really, you know, first off, they were always diluted. Second of all, they were reserved for special occasions, right? So understanding that we live in complete abundance we really need to go and ask the question, do I really need this and will that nourish me? That would be just um, a basis of going like, you know, when you're picking up something in a box particularly. But ancestral health is really what, what supports our system on a cellular level. Because nowadays we're eating for taste, we're eating for a quick fix, and, but it doesn't go deeper because, you know, you used to eat foods which we don't think is palatable right now because it might be too bitter, it might be too spicy. You know, go into another country, the kids grow up with spicy foods. Why? Because it's really good protecting you against parasites. Mm -hmm. But try to give that an American kid. If it's not chicken nuggets, they're not going to eat it. That's but it's something we're cultivating. Yeah, so and he ancestral health health has been something which has been cultivated too. Mm -hmm. But usually the size of the meals is much smaller. Mm -hmm. There is always a certain amount of protein and pro because proteins are a part of our building blocks for every cell structure in our body. Mm -hmm. And there's copious amounts of good fats, yes. which we in this country totally came away from. Petrified of fats in this country. Yeah, because we had that whole no fat thing. And I remember when I first came here and I go like, why would you want to drink no fat milk? That's like wa water with color in it, right? You know? Yeah. And, and I had the conversation with a friend, but she says, yeah, but my family has heart disease. And I go like, and? You know, that was my, my question is like, you know, I wasn't really educated at that point yet what that all meant, you know, in the terms of right. you guys grow up here. But I said, and show me a no fat cow and I'll drink their milk. <laughs> and she was like, huh? And I said, yeah, because, That's you know, if, if you go to a cow and you milk them, it comes it's with a lot of fat. fat. And, That's right. Yeah. And a lot of fat. And we will not think it's palatable at this point. No. Because no. our milk has so homeogenized. Yep. So, so where I go like, I often think, how did my grandparents eat? You know, if they would have bread, they would have a good amount of butter or schmutz, which is like rendered fat from goose or duck on top of it. And then they would put salt on it. So you would combine the grain with a certain amount of fat 
because it slows up that uh, slows down the absorb absorption of the grain into your system but it opens up as well the nutrients and gives you more nutrients to absorb and fat is a beautiful way of getting um, additional energy into your body so and when you're going further back into ancestral health in the hunter and gatherer, if we're just thinking how that used to work is, okay, a group of people would go out and gather food, right? Whether it was berries, herbs, roots, whatever they could find and dig up. And some of them died along the way because they ate the wrong thing. That's how they learned. And then the other group would go and hunt. That took a tremendous amount of work. And then they would eat and they usually wouldn't eat that much. But all of that food was so nutrient dense that it would nourish you. Right. And, you know, I don't want to glorify that time because that time must have been really hard as well. But now we have these amazing choices nowadays. So you actually can go into a grocery store and look at the foods. And I like the quote, and you know, I used to have that on my website before I changed my website, was like, food is ingredients, it doesn't have ingredients. So anything which has a label, you should question. Mm -hmm. If it has more than four ingredients you don't understand, you should question it. Is that really something my body can deal with? Because the system we live in is innately intelligent. And we're bypassing that intelligence by giving it certain foods which are not supportive. So anything which comes from nature usually works with our body. And then depending on who you are and what you're dealing with, how robust your health is or not, you need to make adjustments for that. And that's how I found for myself with paleo because it made sense to me and I said, I can eat all the vegetables there are. Everything on a far farmer's market is accessible to me. And we're lucky we have one here in Nyack, right? Yeah. You know, meats are accessible. Um, a lot of people think of paleo that's really heavy on meats. It's not true. Three, You know, I tell to everybody, if three quarters of your plate is a vegetable, different vegetables, and you have the other quarter as a protein and with some fat, you're fine to go. And the beautiful thing is if you load up your plate with vegetables, you can eat volume, but you're never going to be stuffed right. unless it's potatoes. Right. <laughs> right. I think also, though, we've kind of come up, come away from this whole, like you said before, you know, um, head to tail, this idea, you know, because when you look at um, they would eat all of whatever they caught, right, instead of just having the white meat or the dark meat, you know, they would actually drink the, you know, the bone broth and, and, and have part of the cartilage. And, you know, when I was in Japan, um, I had eaten, um, they do fried fish bones and they're actually delicious and they're oh, wow. really hot. They're very, they're, they're like potato chips, actually, you crunch on them, but they're super high in calcium. Right. Of course, they're bone. Um, so, you know, you, you find these different cultural ways of eating and how they all have a very specific organ system that they're nourishing. And, you know, how, how a friend of mine had um, had a bunch of fractures in his back just recently. And, you know, he's very American. And when I told him he needed to drink bone broth, it was like, oh, what is that bone broth? And it did help. You know, it's going to help the, you know, the cartilage, the bone, the broth, the marrow, all of that. You know, it's that like healing like idea. So yes. and that's very ancestral, too. Absolutely. So, you know, I, I keep I mean, I anybody who wants to talk to me about eating liver, please come and I'm going to have a liver feast because I'm a liver lover and I'm very grateful that I actually really love that food because that was one of the most tremendous tools for my healing. Wonderful. Because liver, and that's the thing, the underestimation of organ meats, right? You know, we're all so bound of eating muscle flesh, you know, which, which is fine, you know, and it tastes great, you know, and, you know, I will not bypass a good steak. But when you go into the organs, yes, it gets, you know, you need to get used to it. And yes, there's a lot of people who really cannot um, eat liver, but there's other ways of getting liver into your system. Mm -hmm. But liver is so incredibly rich in minerals and it has all of the vitamin Bs. 
and particularly now that everybody is doing genetic testing and MTHFR, yep. if if you don't get a certain amount of liver you're not doing the processes of the methylation in your own liver and therefore you know i really try to teach people i said use food as a supplement yeah if that doesn't work then you can add to it but use the foods and eat a variety of it and eat the whole animal and go figure it out i mean the first time i had a fa with tendon i feel like hmm, that's weird but i it was so delicious, mm. but we just don't try it because we're like, oh, that can be, that must be weird. And I said, just try it, have an open mind. You don't have to love it. Mm. And that's the other thing. When you're healing, you don't necessarily have to love everything you eat. Some of the stuff is medicine. Yeah. Medicine is not always like, it doesn't taste like sugar, right? right. right? Yeah, absolutely. I even say to a lot of the women that I treat with menopausal issue, um, um, mental issues, um, I encourage them, especially if they are vegan or vegetarian, you know, if it's something that they could look at by eating meat as just a way to supplement their ability to not, um, you know, they lose a lot of blood every month. So can you take in a little bit of red meat but thinking about it as medicine and not at necessarily as food and and i get the whole idea i love animals so much it's so hard for me to it's hard for me to eat meat from that perspective but um i can't be vegetarian my body won't it just it doesn't work for me it just doesn't work for me and i it's very hard we're in such a polarized time of the world right now so you know you're either in one camp or the other and neither camp wants to see each other's viewpoints and i just you know i i it's hard it's it's hard I, yeah you know adding to that it's interesting you know i've I, I have a couple of friends who are vegan and they do incredibly well only though because they really understand nutrition right because right. you you need to know more and i'm way too lazy I know, I know, I know that protein will give me so much of the building blocks for my yeah. cell structure that I know I'm good, you know, and being conscientious where you source your meats is really important. Absolutely. Yet, yet I know a lot of, not the way to go. Exactly. And then I know, and I know a lot of um, nutritionists who really do well with vegan. And then I refer out because it's not my specialty. And if someone feels strongly about it, they should work with that and figure out a way. And then if they, if they don't, uh, you know, have results then they can always still adjust. Um, but we're on this planet together, all of us, animals and us. And, you know, if you go back to ancestral, health and eating you know we would be eaten by animals too so it would be vice versa so i i feel it's like a cohabitation of a planet we're in yet you know we as humans really can honor where our food comes from and i think that is something we all should do no matter what we eat you know we should honor it and be conscientious about it and and understand where your sourcing comes from yeah and also, you know, I think how it makes you feel emotionally. I think that's another really big piece. You know, we, we like we said before about living in this society where everything is just overabundant and over available. A lot of us um, overeat and overindulge to numb ourselves out or people don't eat because they're numbing themselves out, you know, or starve themselves. And going back to that idea of self-nurturing and self-love, I think food is ultimately the most important way that we can self-love. You know, you want, you want to talk about a wellness movement. It's like, well, how, are you, how do you nurture yourself? Because you can't live without it. You can't. No. And it's really the interesting thing when you're thinking in all the narrative which is going on that we're not talking about eating well. You're right. Which, which is the simplest way of really supporting your system and your immune system yep. is eating well and being, being in the moment with that and being appreciative. Yep. And um, yeah, you know, I just, just read that comment and I have to agree with that. And there are so many local farmers 
especially yeah. in New York State, yeah. who really produce amazing meats, amazing produce, and those are the ones we should support. Uh -huh. you know? Small farmers. Yeah. You know, we used to get, uh, my family used to go, uh, get um, from the Amish farmers, um, and it's funny because it was totally illegal to get um, fat, full fat milk, milk, or I remember oh, wrong, that, wrong raw milk. milk. Yes. Um, and you know, we actually, it's crazy. They used to have to ship it. And on the label, it says um, for pet consumption only, because it was completely illegal for us to, to drink raw milk. When here's the crazy thing, my family and I actually went down to the farm to, to, to check it out. And there, where they did all the milk production, you could eat off the floor. It was so clean. Yeah. I mean, it didn't need to be pasteurized because the cows weren't sick. They weren't on antibiotics. The place wasn't filthy. I mean, it was just truly amazing to be part of that world and to, to drink this raw milk and eat raw butter. Oh, there's nothing better than raw butter. Um, and even yeah. raw milk. I mean, the thing is with raw milk, you're going to have to drink it quick. Yes. You know? It's right. not going to last. Raw enough. ice cream. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> or even raw cream. The top. Raw cream. Yeah. Oh, with berries. It's, yeah, it's incredible. It's, it's incredible. Best. Yeah. It's the best. And it, it is, it's just so fascinating how far removed we are from food and the basic food sources and how far we're removing ourselves now too with this whole being of you know, hygiene and I mean, what we're going through right now, we're eliminating all of the germs which actually support our immune system, right? So we're going into a total sterilized world. So we will need support from conventional medicine. And I don't think that there's something wrong with it, but I really think that the awareness of us paying attention that um, we cannot kill all the germs around us because it will kill us yeah. because we are a big blob of germs yeah we're more bacteria and virus than we're human cells yeah. and it's something really good to know because once you know that you can really work with it and then you can use food as a real support system for yourself and that understanding then that actually when you eat a food and it doesn't make you feel well, that is your body telling you, this is not good for me right now. It doesn't mean that it's always like that, but it's not good for me right now. And actually to listen to that, you know, to really paying attention to what our system is talking to us at all times, because this system is working since the first heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen, it's 930. Thank you so much. No, this is great. I just, you know, I love talking to someone who is so knowledgeable. And, you know, again, it's not about following the newest fad or the newest trend, but it's really going back into your ancestry and understanding um, homeostasis and the ability to be balanced. And ultimately, um, it's what your body is telling you. I think it's just doing self check-ins and saying, how did this make me feel? Yes, really paying attention to yourself, you know, and that's, that's the biggest gift we can give ourselves. Absolutely, yeah. All right, well, tell everyone where to find you and, and Doro's doing um, a, a detox, right? You said for people, so tell everybody about that. Yeah, so I, I, I do um, online programs and the one I'm really doing is the um, a five week restart and it basically is eating a without, you know, eating dairy free, gluten free, sugar free. It's a three, three week de detox um, incorporated. And what I do is I lead you through all of the education. What is digestion? What is blood sugar? What are fatty acids? you know, what are cravings, we go through the functionality of how this system works in a basic way. And then I give meal plans out and um, structure it in such a way that you really can go through what you said before, you know, you can do anything for three weeks, right? 
And then just to understand how clean your system becomes and it's not not eating and it's not restricted in eating either. It's just eating differently and opening up a new world for yourself, how to eat and calming your system down and having less inflammation. And then after that, you learn how to reintroduce certain foods and then you actually really understand what are you reacting to or not. Awesome. And so it starts April 19th and you can find it on my website. And what is that? Dorobodyhealth.com. Perfect. All right, everyone. Thank yeah, you so much for joining. You really are just such such a such a wealth of knowledge, and and I love talking to you. And um, hopefully, we'll be able to share a meal on our deck one of these days since you're oh, like we living will. around. Yeah. The corner from me. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, we will do that. Good. Absolutely. Um, so good so seeing you. You too, everyone. Thank you so much for coming for week 12. Um, next week, I wanted to uh, bring on a local yogi, and she has a really cool program that has to do with, uh, it's called Love Your Brain. And it has, um, it was really meant originally for traumatic brain injured patients and reprogramming neuroplasticity, balance and coordination for those that don't have any traumatic brain injuries, but do want to rewire reprogram so that's just she's a really great insightful person so for everyone integrate health and embrace your wellness and lastly join the collective so you can find this on IGTV it lives there permanently or on my website and you can find the link in my bio thanks everyone for joining Doro thank you so much thank you guys. Bye, All right. have a good night thank, thank you, you so much Bye.